today we're going to be taking a look at the K300, and most importantly, what they've done to update the K300 over the K3. A lot of people who are looking at Kawhi upright pianos these days are very familiar with the K3, their previous 48-inch piano, and the number one question I've been getting these days is, how is it different from the K300? They really just want to know what the differences are and what they can expect, of course, because there's hundreds of reviews on the K3, and that will really help with your research. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing today, taking a look at those differences. I'm going to start with the keys, but we're also going to be dealing with the hammers. We're going to be talking about the soundboard, the case, uh, and, and of course, I'm going to be doing some playing on it as well. So first to the keys. One of the most innovative things that the K300 has done this year is the length of the keys have been extended. Now, I'm obviously not talking about just the white section of the key that you can see. This would be the key that sits behind and actually connects with the rest of the action. This has been extended by Kawhi uh, to experiment with the principle of giving a greater level of control and a greater level of speed and power to the key. One of the differences that often marks the playing experience on a grand piano than an upright piano is that key length. On a grand, you're used to having this very, very long key that's going to give you lots of great depth, uh, lots of good control, especially at the lower dynamic ranges. Upright keys have always been shorter, and uh, it's always been one of the things that really high-level players have complained about. Kawhi's experimenting with this across their entire K series, and of course, that's one of the biggest things that differentiates the K300 from the K3. It really doesn't feel the same. It's not that dissimilar, but if you had them side by side, unquestionably, you're going to have more control in your lower dynamic ranges, and the speed has definitely been increased. So I'm going to demonstrate both of those things for you right now. Play a little Beethoven and then a little bit of Chopin, just to talk about and to demonstrate those differences uh, in low dynamic control as well as speed and response. What I really notice when I play that is how easy and how effortless it is for me to get that response of the lower dynamic range. And to me, that's always a telltale sign of a great instrument. Can I, without thinking too hard about it, get the piano to do exactly what I want? And one of the most difficult things for an instrument maker, on a piano particularly, is having that happen at the lower dynamic range. Now, one of the other elements that's really improved because of the key length is the speed, and I mentioned that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of playing on that right now. Anyway, on and on and on. Definitely, I could play that for hours. It's, it's really, really great to have that crisp, fast response. Now, the K3 certainly did have a great, fast response to it. However, I definitely notice a difference in how solid and how crisp that feels when I'm really, really at top speed. So that's the action. Now, the second thing that they've done uh, to update this from the K3 is that they've gone to a mahogany double-felted hammer. What this is going to give the player really has to do with the complexity of the sound when you're in your upper dynamic range. In other words, when you're really pushing the piano, 
that double felted hammer is going to prevent distortion and it's going to uh, increase the, the, the tonal complexity even when you're just nailing the piano, like some Rachmaninoff or even getting into some really good uh, blues or even like a Billy Joel or something like that. So that's been a nice improvement as well. The third thing that they've done is they've tapered the soundboard a little bit differently on the K300 this time around. Uh, and what I notice on that is the, is the responsiveness of the piano right across the range. Uh, certainly the evenness of what you get when you're playing in the bottom, the middle, or the top ranges of the piano in the K300 are definitely more even than what I noticed on the K3. Even though the K3 was still well above market average, and for its price point, pretty much unbeatable for when they were selling it. Those who have had a chance to play the K3, when they sit down at the K300, that evenness across the range is definitely going to come out loud and clear. They've also, on the K300, updated the case. And I certainly enjoy design myself. And for anybody who's got an eye for furniture uh, or an eye for design, they're going to notice those subtle, clean lines that they've updated. They've gone to a slightly more flat bevel. I really, really like what they've done here. It fits in with a lot of other modern decor that's being sold. Uh, and I've seen this look stunning in condos and contemporary homes, open concept homes, uh, it, certainly even in commercial spaces. This works really, really, really well. Now, the last thing I'm going to mention is the resale value. Because the K300, being a brand new model, it's a little bit difficult to actually get information on how exactly it's going to do in the resale market. And of course, when you're buying an instrument that's up in the seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollar range, it's always a question that's on people's minds. Am I going to be able to sell this? Or what can I trade this in for again down the road? Is it even going to be a possibility? Well, certainly we can look to the K3 uh, for some cues as to how well it's going to do. When I look at K3 and I compare it to another bellwether model in the market, such as Yamaha U1, it's pretty clear that given their starting point to where they're selling on open markets like eBay or Kijiji, uh, the proportion of depreciation is almost equal and it's very strong. Still to this day, 2015, it is not possible to beat a Japanese piano for resale or depreciation factors uh, for anything outside of a handmade performance level piano, uh, which continues to make this instrument a really, really strong performer. So, Looking to the K3 uh, for those cues, one can definitely assume that having increased the strength and the length of the key, improved the geometry and the action, uh, they continue to produce a very, very high quality case um, using solid brass hardware and of course the quality control which still leads the industry. Um, certainly it's, it's, it's quite reasonable to assume that the K300 might even beat some of the depreciation factors uh, that uh, people are already seeing on the K3 in the market. Uh, so I would say sound investment, a really great responsive piano uh, for the money. And for anybody who's looking for an upright piano, either for a, a teaching situation, uh, a piano for their home to enjoy, the K300 almost has to be a must on your list of instruments to check out. So I'll leave you with one last piece. And again, Stu Harrison for Miriam Pianos in Toronto, Canada. Thank you.